In podcast episode number 50, I talked to Andrew Jaggi about traumatic and atraumatic shoulder instability. Andrew is a physio consultant, shoulder specialist at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in Stanmore, UK. She is a past president of the European Society of Shoulder and Elbow Rehabilitation, abbreviated as USA, and a published researcher with a particular interest in shoulder instability. So what is shoulder instability? Andrew explained that partial displacements of the shoulder are difficult to document on x-ray. So the primary symptom above all is a feeling of instability reported by the patient that can include other symptoms such as pain or kinesiophobia as well. Why can shoulder instability hurt? In traumatic dislocations, it's obviously the dislocation itself with the labrum and the capsule as the nociceptive drivers. However, in the atraumatic group, it tends to be more of a myogenic type of pain, while some patients also report a neurogenic component like burning, tingling, and referred pain to the hand. But again, pain is often not the main complaint, but instability. We then went on to talk about the Stanmore classification. The TUBS group, or POL1, are patients with traumatic unilateral instability, often with bankard lesions, which require surgery. Patients with traumatic lesions are also the biggest group with around 90% of instability cases in practice. Those patients often have a high recurrence of instability despite rehabilitation. Traditionally, these patients were males predominantly, but that might be more related to sport-specific activities that males pursue more than gender itself. The second group, or Paul 2 is called EMBRI. Those cases are atraumatic, multidirectional, and require bilateral rehabilitation or an inferior capsular shift surgery if rehabilitation fails. This group is often called born loose or worn loose. Think of swimmers, throwers, or other overhead athletes. The ratio of males to females in this group is around one to one. The third group is the muscle patterning group on the bottom left of the Stanmore triangle. Those patients often have general hyperlexity, not just in the shoulder, without trauma and they show no abnormalities of the shoulder on scans. These people have a very obvious muscle movement disorder component leading to instability. In this group we see around 60% females and around 40% males and a lot of patients with collagen disorders. Those patients often have concomitant disorders and symptoms such as chronic pain and fibromyalgia, anxiety, depression, abdominal pain and gastrointestinal issues. In summary, Andrew mentioned that the more trauma there is to the shoulder, the more structural damage we can expect and the more a surgical procedure may be indicated. The less of the trauma and the damage, the more we are looking at a muscular control issue that should be served with rehab. Andrew then touched on the structural damage we often see after dislocations. These are heel sex lesions, so a dent on the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head in about 50% of dislocations. Then we have bony bankard lesions, which are glenoid fractures, which we often see in the young athletic population, but also in elderly females as a result of falls. About 10 to 15% of dislocations affect the axillary nerve and about 30% lead to rotator cuff tears, which are both more common in the older group. Angie then took us through her patient history process. For her, it's important to manage patient expectations. She looks at the initial onset of the shoulder complaint, documented evidence of dislocation and a mechanism of relocation. Anxiety about moving the arms away from the body or above shoulder height usually indicates anterior instability and cross body movements and taking the top off, for example, often hint at multidirectional or posterior elements of instability. Obviously, it's then also important to ask the patient which positions and movements provoke symptoms. Don't forget to ask about other joint issues, particularly in the Embry group and what other treatments have occurred already as well as previous scans. She concludes her patient history with shared decision-making on treatment goals. During the objective exam, Andrew likes to keep it simple. Observe, possibly touch, and then move. She also checks for the sulcus sign and if the joint looks out of place and for muscle wasting. In an acute setting, she also advised 
to check for sensation of the axillary nerve and to make sure you don't miss the AC joint. Andrew then explained that she moves on to basic assessment measuring active external and internal rotation and flexion, checking for feelings of instability. The apprehension and relocation test can be helpful as well as the posterior apprehension test and she also uses Gaggy's hyperabduction test to check for inferior instability. When testing the rotator cuff, Andrew checks both external and internal rotation throughout the whole range in supine and prone position. While you can objectify your findings with the dynamometer, Andrew likes to use lag signs in practice. With the belly press and a lift off signs, you can test the anterior cuff at extremes of the patient's movement. Findings of weakness can tell you what you need to work on with the patient during rehab. We then talked about Andrew's paper from 2012 where they observed muscle patterning in atraumatic shoulder instability. What her group noticed was that the lat dorsi and pec major were more active than expected and even when those muscles are actually antagonists of a movement. At the same time, they noticed reduced activity of the infraspinatus. They hypothesized that this disbalance between stabilizers that hold the shoulder in place and the big moving muscles could potentially result in a translation of the humeral head. I then asked what to do about overactive muscles. Andrew explained that if one particular muscle is working too much, another muscle is probably not working enough. So rather than trying to inhibit or decrease overactive muscles, it's probably easier to focus on strengthening the ones that are weak. She stressed that really extreme hypotonic muscle activation patterns may be more related to the psychology of the patients. So it's more a neurological dystonia and or functional neurological disorder or chronic pain state. Our next topic was predictors for recurrent dislocations, which are bony bankard lesions, higher levels of activity and younger age. A paper by Margie Olds also suggests a period of immobilization, higher levels of pain and disability, and kinesiophobia on top of the already mentioned factors as risk factors. This study did not find a difference between the dominant and the non-dominant shoulder. We then continue to briefly talk about risk factors for the development of osteoarthritis. Generally, the feeling is that patients with a traumatic dislocation who have more than a 20% bone loss, so a significant hill sex lesion and glenoid fracture, probably have an increased risk of developing osteoarthritis. In the atraumatic group, without trauma and without obvious pathology, we have not seen any evidence of arthritis yet. One question I was always wondering about was about relocating the shoulder as a physio. Andrew mentioned that they even teach patients to relocate their shoulder themselves in the atraumatic group. In a traumatic group, especially in older patients, we should probably better x-ray the shoulder first. Of course, we talked about rehab as well. Andrew explained that after first time anterior dislocation, a sling is now purely given for comfort. On top of that, there are no real limits and we can start loading a patient's shoulder and do what the patient feels comfortable with from their first day on. Exposing them to positions where they might be anxious is important to reduce kinesiophobia early on. Furthermore, we should not only focus on strength and external rotation, but on the whole cuff and increase the speed of the exercises. So plyometrics and explosive exercises are important as well. In terms of rehab duration, the Sinex study showed that we can get people back within 12 weeks. Andrew stressed that we still need research comparing accelerated rehab versus a more conservative approach to really be able to say something about the effectiveness of both approaches compared. At last, we talked about Andrew's latest research project that will be published anytime soon. This was a randomized controlled trial comparing an inferior capsular shift versus just a diagnostic arthroscopy in atraumatic shoulder instability. So they were comparing a sham placebo operation versus an actual tightening of the shoulder in patients with non-traumatic shoulder instability. What they found was that all patients improved at six months and there was a 40% improvement in both the diagnostic arthroscopy group as well as the shift group and that continued to improve at one year and two years. We finished off by Andrew stressing that it's all about what you believe that kind of gets you better. So if you're confident as a clinician and you're confident about your treatment, 
the outcome is going to be better. And if the patient believes in you and the patient is confident, whatever the intervention might look like, they're going to get better. All right, so this was a brief summary of podcast episode 50 with Andrew Jaggi. I hope I could raise your curiosity to listen to the whole episode to learn more about shoulder instability. If you would like to have more resources on this episode, head to our website physiodudas.com where you can download the transcript and infographic. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in another video. Bye.